Hey class, so today I want to go over the pathway of vision for you. So we'll talk about a pathway of sound, and today we're going to talk about the eyes, we're going to go over the pathway of vision. So if you think back to embryonic development, there's a video on that too, but basically the eyes are going to be formed when the brain tissue is formed, which is really kind of cool because they end up having so many different cranial nerves that supply the eyes, um, tissue, nervous tissue and cells that supply the eyes. And so it's really kind of a cool thing that happens with your eyes, but it all ends up forming from that diencephalon. Now there are three portions to the eye as far as like layers. So you have this outer layer, which we'll talk about a little bit more today. So you have the sclera, which is the white of your eye. You have the cornea, which is that transparent front portion to your eye. And then you have your middle layer, which is very vascular. So this is gonna be like your choroid, um, your iris itself. That's those, those parts of the eye. And then the inner layer, think back towards like the back of the eye. So you have your retina there, you have photoreceptors, which are your rods and your cones. You have your bipolar cells, those components there on that pigmented layer that then attach to the optic nerve. So the pathway of sight is pretty simple. Um, we see things because there are wavelengths of color and light has to be present. So if there's light present, there's an object present, and then you have a pathway that it can go through so that the brain can interpret what it is. As long as all those components are there, then you should be able to see. If at any point something is broken along that pathway or missing, we're going to have a problem. So starting off, um, visible light. So for humans, you have probably talked about this before, but for humans, you have this visible light spectrum known as Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Chances are you talked about this in freshman biology. Remember back to like chloroplast when you talked about photosynthesis and chloroplasts appear green because they reflect these wavelengths of light and that's why they appear green. The chloroplasts are shown in the picture to the right. So that's just to kind of give you a refresher. Now there are things outside of this visible light spectrum. There are waves of light that we cannot detect, we cannot see. And those kinds are like radio waves, microwaves, um, x-rays. But two of them that are very close to our visible light spectrum that some organisms can actually see would be IR, which is infrared, and then UV, so ultraviolet. So to give you an example with those, um, in Louisiana, we have like pit vipers, which are cotton, uh, copperheads and cotton mouths, and they can see IR light, and it appears as heat. And so your first picture shows you a mouse and how we would see a mouse. To a snake, it's gonna appear heated, right? So they can see it better. And this is gonna help them out with their predator behavior. Another example would be UV light and bees. So bees are very fascinating uh, insects. They um, are very social. And so um, they're also capable of seeing UV light. And so you can see in the picture on the left compared to the picture on the right, where they can actually target in on where the pollen is and where there's nectar. So the most abundant places to find food sources. That's how they utilize being able to see with UV light. So for a lab, you have this model. And with this model, we are going to imagine that the arrow represents an image that you need to see. And following that arrow will get us through this pathway of vision. All right, so let's look at this. So as an image comes into the eye, it has to first go through the cornea. The cornea on this model is identified at number one. The cornea is a transparent tissue and it's found on the anterior area of the eye. What's interesting about the cornea is that you probably have heard before that people can have corneal transplants. So it's an organ structure that you can actually donate. What's cool about corneal transplants is there's about a 75 to 95% transplant uh, success rate. And the interesting thing though, is that with most of your other transplants, they actually have to match the donor. And with corneal tissue, you typically don't have to match the donor. So we're not worried about blood typing and stuff like that. 
Once that image goes into the cornea, it's then going to go into the anterior chamber at number two. Your anterior chamber has aqueous fluid. Aqueous fluid is also known as aqueous humor. So when you see humor, it's not like ha ha ha, it's humor as in fluid. So you have aqueous humor here. You're also going to have aqueous humor in that posterior chamber right behind the iris. And then in the posterior cavity, you're going to have vitreous humor. So what the anterior chamber does, as well as the posterior chamber, which is between the iris and the lens, uh, both of those are going to have this aqueous humor. And the aqueous humor provides nutrients to the cornea. So the cornea itself is not very vascularized. And so where it gets its nutrients ends up being from your tears and then also from this humor that's located here. So that's gonna help with the cornea being healthy. So while we're still on the exterior kind of surface of the eye, let's go ahead and look at the conjunctiva as well as your rectus muscles. So your conjunctiva is located at number eight. And this is an area that helps push debris out of the way if you end up with an eyelash in your eye, it's gonna help move that eyelash closer to your tear ducts or catch it. Because it deals with moving debris and whatnot, it also can get infected. And when it gets infected, we call this conjunctivitis, which is also known as pink eye. You have two rectus muscles shown. So if you think back to your cranial nerve information, you know that you have four rectus muscles to the eye named after anatomical positioning. In this picture, you're gonna see that number nine is your medial rectus and number 10 is your lateral rectus. And because you can see the medial and the lateral, that should give you insight in how this eye is cut. So we're basically looking at an inferior view of the eye and we're pulling that, in, that inferior view out. So basically we were to take my right eye and slice it and then pull out the bottom portion of it. That's what we're gonna look at. That would make sense why number 10 is my lateral rectus muscle and number nine is my medial rectus muscle. Number 11 is going to be your sclera. Your sclera is the white of the eye. So again, it's that thicker type tissue that's gonna help protect the eye. Moving back to those arrows, going through the corneal tissue at number one and then into that anterior chamber at number two, you'll see behind that anterior chamber is a hole that's your pupil. It's not labeled here but it's that space in between number two and number five. Number five would actually represent your lens. Your lens should be a transparent tissue that sits in this cavity here where number five is. And it's not represented on the model in this picture, but it would be a, a piece of transparent tissue there. The lens is going to be held in place by suspensory ligaments at number 20. Those are gonna help connect it to the ciliary body. The lens can become thinner when it's pulled or it can become short and fatter whenever those muscles relax. And so those muscles are those ciliary bodies, the processes there, and then the suspensory ligaments are gonna help hold that lens in place. Your pupil is going to change its shape, its size because of the iris. The iris is number three, that's the colored muscle area. And so when the muscles contract or relax, the pupil then gets bigger or smaller. Your posterior cavity at number six is going to have vitreous humor. It's also known as your vitreous cavity or your vitreous chamber, and that's going to help keep the shape of the eyeball. So it's going to supply this fluid that's jelly-like in order to keep that pressure there and keep the eyeball shape the shape it is. If you look at the ciliary bodies, the ciliary bodies are going to be made up of number 19 and 21. 19 are your ciliary processes. Those are gonna secrete aqueous humor into that posterior chamber. And then you have your ciliary muscles. Those are the muscles that allow the lens to change its shape. And then the suspensory ligaments are gonna hold the lens in place and they're gonna connect it to the ciliary body. As that image comes through that posterior cavity, when you look at the posterior cavity at number um, six, it's kind of misleading that it identifies number six in this one little spot. Your posterior cavity, if you were to think of it more like a latex balloon that fills this whole area, so number six all the way to 16 on both sides to number 17, all the way back to, to 16 in the very back where the retina is and your optic nerve, imagine all of that was a big balloon. Well, that balloon would end up being your retina 
and it's going to be filled with this vitreous humor. So it's the whole space there, the whole bowl and everything. Number 14 on your list is your choroid layer. Your choroid layer is a vascular layer. And then number 16 is that back wall there, and that's going to be your retina. Your retina is a nervous region, and that's and it basically is going to receive light from the lens and convert that light into some kind of neural signal, so some type of impulse. That impulse is then going to go through some cells and make its way to the optic nerve. Wrapping it up with what happens at the posterior aspects of the eye, at number 34, you're going to have your macula lutea, which is your yellow disc, and it contains a lot of cones, not so many rods, but there's a specific spot in the macula lutea known as fovius centralis that actually contains no rods at all. It's all cones. And fovius centralis is going to help you focus in and sharpen an image. Number 36 is your optic disc. That's where your optic nerve ties into your eyeball. Here you have no cells that can detect the image itself. And so it's your functional blind spot. And there's another video about the blind spot that you can watch. Your body and your brain has had to figure out a way to make up for the fact that you're blind in your eye. And then if we zoom into that retina detail, what you have here is you have a pigmented layer at number 43 that's there to absorb excess light so that the photoreceptors can basically give you a clearer signal. And then it transmits that information to number 39, which are your bipolar cells. Synaptic connection then is at number 38 with the ganglion cells. And then that sends it on over to your optic nerve at number 37. So your photoreceptors have your rods and your cones. Cones start with a C. I think color when I think of cones. Rods are going to end up being your nighttime vision. Those are going to deal more with your black, whites, grays. And so cone, C-O, reminds me color, C-O. All right, so from this point, what happens is that it goes from that optic nerve to your optic chiasma. And then from your optic chiasma, it's then going to send it to the thalamus and the occipital lobe for processing. So your thalamus is going to work like your gatekeeper for your sensory information. Your thalamus weeds out all sensory stuff except for smell and it basically determines if it's relevant. And so if what you're seeing at this moment is relevant, then it sends it on over to the occipital lobe. And so that's what you see now. And so this back portion will then process the information. So that's pretty much a quick overview of the pathway of vision. If you have any questions about it, remember you can check out some of the other videos. You can drop me an email, but I hope you guys have a great day.